Math 1314, Tyler Jr. College, section 3.1, Quadratic Functions. In this chapter, we're going to explore polynomial functions and rational functions. Now, we've discussed polynomials before. Uh, polynomial in general is just a sum or difference of powers, whole number powers, of a particular variable. Usually x, but that choice is fairly arbitrary. Uh, the, the polynomial functions that we've seen so far in the previous chapter were mostly linear functions. We, we figured out their graphs, their slopes, their intercepts, and uh, we figured out the relationship between parallel and perpendicular lines and all kinds of stuff. And we have run across some other categories of functions such as absolute value or, or radical or even rational where we put one a polynomial on top of another, but we really haven't analyzed any of those functions to a great extent. Maybe the one that we've talked about the most, and that's not saying much, is a quadratic, because we know that their graphs are parabolas. In this first section of chapter three, we're going to thoroughly discuss quadratic functions and analyze everything we can about them prior to sketching a graph and using that information to not only sketch a graph, but to solve some applications. To start with, let's talk about graphs of quadratic functions in general form. A quadratic in func function in general form is a function of the form f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c, where a is not equal to zero. It's kind of assumed that the a, the b, and the c are real numbers, so no i's inside of this function. So what do we already know about these? Well, if we didn't have the stuff in after the x squared, and we didn't have the a, we already know that the graph of f of x equals x squared is a parabola that opens up and bottoms out at the origin. If we put a number in front of it, that invokes a vertical stretch or shrink dependent upon the size of the number. But we also know that if the number is negative, it reflects it across the x-axis. Adding the bx and the c term do not change the direction that the parabola opens. So one thing that we can say right away is if a is greater than zero, we get a parabola that opens upwards. Now it may or may not be located here. I'm just drawing a parabola that opens up. And if a is less than zero, then we get a parabola that opens down. Now be careful. These are very specifically drawn parabolas. Both of them have two x-intercepts. They both have a y-intercept. Even this one, we just haven't reached it yet. But it is possible for a quadratic function and its graph to have no x-intercepts. For example, if this parabola were high, higher than the x-axis, it would fail to intersect it. Or if this one were lower than the axis, it would, x axis, it would fail to intersect it as well. So keep in mind that I'm not implying that there are always x intercepts on parabolas. There could be. However, there are some features on parabolas that we can always take for granted. We can assume are always there. One of which is the point where the parabola turns around. If the parabola is opening upwards, then it transitions from decreasing to increasing. In a previous section, we referred to that as a relative minimum. On the other parabola that's upside down, it starts out increasing and then it turns to decreasing. We refer to that as a relative maximum. But in the context of a parabola, regardless of whether it's a minimum or a maximum, that turning point is called the vertex. All parabolas have them. Part of our job is to figure out where they are as a tool for graphing and as for solving some applications. Now, another thing about parabolas, more so the one on the top than the one I drew on the bottom, is that they are symmetrical in the sense that there is a line of symmetry over which the right half is a mirror image of the left half. It shouldn't surprise you that that line of symmetry drops straight through the vertex. Again, the one on the bottom isn't drawn very symmetrical, but let's just assume that it was drawn to scale. This line that serves as, an, as a mirror image, excuse me, as a mirror for the left and right halves of the parabola, is called the axis of symmetry. 
Since it's a vertical line, we know that its equation is x equals a number. But what's that number? Well, whatever that number is, it's also the x-coordinate of the vertex. So if we can find the coordinates of the vertex in terms of the coefficients a, b, and c, then we can also come up with the equation of the axis of symmetry. So what I'd like to do for the rest of this video is formulate a plan of attack for locating the vertex. Now, how can we do that? There's a couple of ways to locate the vertex. Uh, if you know calculus, there's a really easy way to locate the vertex. But let's assume that we're not using calculus. One thing about the vertex is it's on the axis of symmetry. And what makes the axis of symmetry the axis of symmetry is every point on the left side has a mirror image on the right side. For example, these two x-intercepts are mirror images of each other. Their average, or if you will, their midpoint, would have the same x-coordinate as the vertex. So now we can formulate a strategy for locating the vertex. If we can come up with a representation for the x-intercepts, then their midpoint, aka their average, would tell us exactly where the vertex is related in terms of its x-coordinate. Okay, that's great, except for one problem. We don't currently have something to represent the x-intercepts, but we do. Recall that to find x-intercepts, if I can spell, an x-intercept occurs when the y value on the point is zero. And in a function, the y is what comes out. So to find the x-intercepts, we need to solve f of x equals zero. In general, for any function. For this function, that means we need to solve ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to zero. Oh, wait a second. Don't we have a formula for solving this quadratic equation? Uh, yeah. The quadratic formula. So if we got out the quadratic formula, its solutions would tell us what makes this equal to zero, which would tell us the x-intercepts. Well, I know the solutions to the quadratic formula. x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. And if you're thinking you didn't write the minus, I know because I want to think about these two x-intercepts individually. So we'll call this one x1 for the first x-intercept. And for the second x-intercept, it would be the quadratic formula's results, except with the minus. So negative b minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. OK, so now we have our x-intercepts. We can locate the x-coordinate of the vertex by taking their average. I'm going to represent the x-coordinate of the vertex as x subscripted with a v. So right now, I'm generically referring to the vertex as x sub v, and I guess we'll call it y sub v also for now. So to find the x-coordinate of the vertex, we simply, <laughs> simply have to average the two x-intercepts. And this looks a little intimidating because what I'm implying is I want to take both of these monstrous expressions, put it right here and right there, I hope everything plays nice. Don't worry, it does, and here's why. Adding these two expressions is a lot easier than it may look for two reasons. Number one, now let me put a red circle around them so they're easy to see. Number one, I'm adding two fractions, but they already have a common denominator. So that's good. That just means that their sum will have the same common denominator. So, okay, so we add the numerators, and here's where things get even better. In the numerators, there are essentially four terms, a negative b, a plus square root, a negative b, and a minus of the same square root. So when I combine them, the negative b and the negative b combine to give a negative 2b, but what happens to the two square roots? Because they're opposites and they match, they cancel. So adding these two x-intercepts is actually pretty easy. We get negative b over negative 2a. Well, these two twos cancel, so let's just write negative b over a. But how do we deal with this over 2? Well, there's a couple of ways to clean up this whole fraction. 
One way is to multiply both sides by the denominator of the smaller fraction, which is A. That will give you enough ammunition to do this, leaving a negative B on top and a 2A on the bottom. And that's as simple as that's going to get. So by analyzing the geometric aspects of this parabola, its line of symmetry, uh, midpoint of the x-intercepts, etc., we just came up with not only a formula, but a pretty, simply for pretty simple formula to calculate the vertex's x-coordinate. Well, that's handy. So let's start writing down how to find the vertex of this thing. For the vertex, the x-coordinate of the vertex is negative b over 2a. Now, for memorization purposes, if you know the quadratic formula, this is embedded in it. It's right there. Because remember, the square roots cancel when you add these, and then you cut it in half, which gets rid of the 2 in front of the negative 2b. But wait a minute, a vertex is an ordered pair. I need a y-coordinate also. How are we going to find the y-coordinate? Well, this is even easier to think. I have a function and an x. How do you get a y when you have a function and an x? Answer, plug the x into the function. So I'm not going to give you a formula for the y-coordinate, but a plan. The plan is to take whatever you get here, which currently is called negative b over 2a, and substitute it into the formula, into the function, excuse me. The result will be the y-coordinate. And now that we have the vertex, we can write the equation of the axis of symmetry. <coughs> excuse me. Because after all, the axis of symmetry is a vertical line, so its equation is x equals, but it goes through the vertex so it's x equals this x. So x equals negative b over 2a. And just like that, we got a formula that will tell us where the lower high point on any quadratic function in general form is. That, coupled with the axis of symmetry, a plan for finding x-intercepts, and for y-intercepts, which are easy, and we pretty much got almost everything we need to graph parabolas, at least parabolas that are in general. In the next video, we'll take a look at a specific example of graphing a parabola in general form.